Hey, if you've got a Bible, we're going to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, young people that are at Limitless Festival, don't worry, it's, it's slightly different to the sermon you've already heard. Matthew chapter 14, and we're going to be starting from verse 22 as we explore a famous passage. We've been going through a series called Here to There. Everyone say, Here to There. You can be loud, you can speak to me, you can shout me down, don't worry, I don't get nervous if you do that, so please do speak out. We can say amen, hallelujah, preach it, white boy, do whatever you want, I don't mind, okay? <laughs> Matthew 14, 22, and we're going to be looking from here to there. Haven't we had a, a great time in this series, Nigel and Femi, last few weeks, just speaking into our lives, we've been exploring how to get from here to there. We've looked at Jesus in the, at the wedding of Cana, and he's t- um, transforming the water to wine. Femi yesterday, um, last week, sorry, unpacked Colossians 1, and spoke about how we need to be faithful to the gospel, and how the gospel doesn't just influence us on the day we come to know Jesus, it influences our lives every single day from that moment. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, today I'm going to be looking at a famous passage that many of you know. And many of you have heard sermons on. I'm hoping just to bring to you a few things that I think are helpful as we transition from here to there. The here is where you're at right now. In your situation, in your circumstances, whether it be really good, really bad, or quite normal. And the there is exactly what God has got for you in the future. How many people know that God has got plans for every single servant of Jesus Christ? Amen? And we want to get there. We want to continue to see what God has got for us in the there. And we're hopefully going to learn a few things that I believe are helpful to get to the there. Matthew 14, 22. For those watching online, it will come on your screens as well, so you can follow along. It says these words. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side, whilst he dismissed the crowd. And after he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. Not too normal. Jesus is pretty cool. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified, and it's a ghost, they shouted and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I don't be afraid. Before we move on, aren't we thankful that we serve a God that consistently responds to fear? That the fears in our lives and the troubles we have going on, we serve in a God who doesn't ignore them or is void from them, but we serve a God that responds to them and communicates to us in the middle of our fears. Hey, hey, come on. I'll take it, I'll take it. (laughs) Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came towards Jesus. That's some power right there. That's a cool story. I wish I could do that in front of the young people because they'd like me a bit more. (laughs) But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. And when they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought all their sick to him and begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak and all who touched it were healed. Lord, bless your word and allow it to shape our hearts. Amen. Why don't you high five three people and say, we will get there. 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 You might be a good-looking church, but you're horrendous at high fives. That's all I'm saying. We will get there. Uh, we'll hopefully get to the end of this sermon. <laughs> nice, you shouldn't be laughing at that. <laughs> Have you ever found yourself in a season where you are so ready to move on from that season? Okay, I'm preaching to the cold here. I can see. Ever found yourself in a moment of life, a season of life, where things aren't quite how you like them? 
Things have been a little bit different to what you may expect or anticipate, and you are ready to move on from that season. Maybe the season's been a little bit stormy. Maybe the season's been a little bit difficult. Maybe the season's been quite hard on your soul. Things are a little bit confusing. I once had a difficult season. I was, I've had many difficult seasons, actually. <laughs> but I once had a particular difficult season. When I was 16 years old, I'd just left school. I'd just got my GCSEs, just like many of our young people have got. And aren't we thankful that we got lots of good grades back from our young people's grades this, this week? Lots of people done amazing. Rejoice in the celebration of good grades, young people, but understand that grades don't define you. It is the calling of God that defines you and he will propel you to where he wants you to go. So those that didn't even do well, there is hope in that and stay strong and keep following God's lead within them situations. I found myself in this season exactly where we're talking about, just got my GCSEs back. I was happy, I was content. I'd just moved away from the, the school and the area where I was brought up, which is called Scunthorpe. Don't go there because it's not a nice place. Oh, we got a few people, come on. I was raised there, and I did my secondary school there, and I left Scumfort, praise the Lord, taking us to green pastures, and um, I went up to the northeast, and if you don't know, that's where God lives, uh, he's a beautiful man, and uh, you may laugh, but when you get to heaven, you're going to sound like me, so it's all good, um, and I got there, and I... I got saved. I became a Christian. The best thing that has ever happened in my life took place. Jesus Christ saved me from darkness and brought me into light. And he, he released me from shackles of death and pain and frustration and moved me into a newness of creation because that's what Jesus' desire is for all humanity. That all can be saved. None can be lost. He desires to bring his children home to release you into the purposes and plans that he has for you. And I encountered this moment 16 years old, just done my GCSEs, and I was in church, a small church of around 50 to 100 people. I started getting involved with the youth work. This is where my passion arose for young people because I started to realize that we need people to speak into the generation of young people because they are going to be people that are going to be leading things in the future. Yeah. And I'm desperate to see a generation cling on to the pursuit of God. It makes them, it's their culture to see God move in their schools, move in their colleges, move in their universities. I pray that we release people from this church that are bold enough to change their surroundings. And this is where I found this passion. And this is where I moved into this calling of God that I believe God has placed on me. And there was one moment I was in a church service. And if I'm being very truthful, I was extremely bored. Anyone been there before? <laughs> Anyone there right now? <laughs> Come on. And um, I, I got a phone call in the middle of this sermon. It's actually right in the middle of someone preaching. And I looked at my phone. It was one of my old friends from school that I had left about six months prior. And I thought, I better take this call. They don't usually call me. I'd actually disconnected from a lot of these guys. And I went out and I went into the car park and I took this phone call and I answered it. And it was my friend called Matty. And I went, hey, Matty, how's it going? Sorry, I've not been in contact recently. Loads of things have happened. Loads has changed. I hope you're doing well. And as soon as he spoke, I realized that something was different in his voice. But he said, hey, mate, where are you at? And I said, well, I'm just in church at the moment, actually in the car park, I've just come out of a service to speak to you. Is everything okay? And he said, well, no, not, not really. Something's bad's happened. And I said, okay, well, what's going on? Well, he said, you know, one of our best friends, and I'm not going to say his name, he's passed away. He's died, 16 years old, gone. He's no longer alive. In fact, at the age of 16... He found out that he was terminally ill with cancer. And within the space of six months, his life was taken away from us, his friends and his family. He started to cry on the phone. And he said, you need to come back, mate. There's loads of people here that are hurting and broken. And there's loads of chaos on. And I'm in the middle of a storm. So I got on the first train that day. My mum and dad, and I love my mum and dad, paid for me to go there straight away. And I travelled two hours to get to Scunthorpe. I got off the train. I was picked up by a family. I went straight to the house of the person who had just passed away. And there in front of me was brothers, sisters, a girlfriend, and a dad crying their eyes out. And I sat down with them. And this was the first moment in my Christian journey that I'd encountered a storm. 
a season I was desperate to leave behind me in the past, a season that I was, I'm on to the next one, I'm here right now, but God, I'm ready for the there. A season of confusion and questions of why would God allow this to happen? If God is a loving God and he's real, as you say, Sean, then why do these things take place? And here I am, riddled with confusion, riddled with questions, not having the answers. We went for the funeral, I sat on the front row, I looked back and I saw some of my good friends and brothers carry this guy's coffin down to the front and lay it down right in front of me. And I saw a room of about 400 people who turned up from the town, sing Amazing Grace together and say their last goodbyes to a 16-year-old boy. I got back on the train and on the way back I cried my eyes out and I got angry at God. Why does this happen, God? Why would you allow me to go through this? Why would you allow the family to go through this? Why would you allow him to go through this? Storms in life take place and they hurt. And it's in them moments when we're in the here of pain and frustration and confusion, we want to know what the there is of God. Peter was a man who wasn't in this situation. I know we all know that he got into this situation as he got into a storm. But Peter in this time, just before this passage starts, was actually in a really good place. He was walking around a year prior to this. I preached a month ago on the story of where Peter first met Jesus on the fishing boats and that Jesus turned up and the boats broke and the nets broke and Jesus surrendered everything. He left his family, his friends, his boat, his fish behind and he followed Jesus with everything. Here we are a year later. Peter has seen Jesus do some amazing things. Eyes have been opened that were blind. Deaf ears have popped open just because Jesus has asked them to. People who were lame and crippled for life have risen because Jesus has said, get up and walk. Your faith has made you well. People who were dead have suddenly come back to life because Jesus said, hey, your time is not done yet. Up you get. And Peter's seen all this. In fact, he's here right now. is quite comfortable. He's not in a bad place. He's in quite a good place. He's walking around. He's here and his here is quite nice. He's not even thinking about the bear because the he is good. He's made the right decision. He's followed Jesus. He's seen Jesus do things. Everything he thought was true and correct and accurate. He's happy. And maybe you find yourself in this season before. Maybe you're there right now. Maybe everything is going okay in your life. Maybe you, your family is fine. You've got a happy family. Maybe you're happy in your job. Maybe you've got a happy wife and a happy wife means happy life. I know that because I'm engaged and I'm learning. Good job. Maybe everything's okay. And this is where Peter was. He wasn't in the storm like I was at 16. He was in quite a comfortable situation. And then Jesus just says, hey, we're going to go back to the place you came from. Now, what we often miss over here is when the boat landed at the end of this story, they landed in a place of Gennesaret. That is the exact same place where Jesus first encountered Peter. That story I preached on a month ago, they are going back to that very same place. This is like the place where you first met Jesus. Think of the church, think of the place, think of the area where you first encountered Jesus Christ. Your eyes were opened, you was brought from darkness to light. Jesus is now taking you back to this place. He says, hey Peter, you know this lake, you know these seas, you you fished here, you worked here for years, you know them, off you go back to your place. Can you take the disciples? I'll meet you on the other side. And Peter's like, yeah, no smoke, absolutely fine. So he gets on the boat and the boat starts to sail into the distance and then Jesus turns around to his disciples. Disciples that have just been healed and marveled at the word of God. Disciples that are thick into the presence of God and Jesus says, hey, it's time to leave now. You can meet me on the other side or you can go back to your house and rejoice in what God has done. And the crowd started to go away. And then we come to a a verse that I believe is so crucial to us understanding, no matter what your season is right now, and no matter what your hair looks like right now, it is so crucial to understand that this is a prominent verse and command of in Scripture to get to the theirs of what God has got for your life. It says these words. It says, He went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. To pray. Nothing astounding, no major miracle, 
nothing drastic, nothing that jumps off the page and hits us in our heart. It is just a simple verse that we often go over, but it's there for a reason. And what I find interesting is Jesus didn't turn to his disciples and say, hey guys, can you leave me now because I'm going to pray. You guys can be unholy over there. I'm going to go be holy in this corner. I'm sitting in the holy corner, shabba shaka, kind of Coke, Pepsi, let's go for it. He didn't say to his disciples, hey, you guys go and fight the waves and get to the other side because I'm going to take the holy route and I'm going to fast and pray over here while you continue on your business. He didn't do that. He said, hey, guys, can you leave? I'll meet you on the other side. Hey, guys, can you go away? He hid the fact that he was going to pray. Why did he do that? The reason why he did that is because there is power in the secret place. There is power in the secret place. When nobody knows, when nobody sees, no Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter, nice little photo over the top with a coffee mug and a pen and paper, nothing at all. By himself to pray. You see on the screen here, Matthew 11 and Psalm 91. And I love Psalm 91. Many of you have heard these verses before and it's been speaking to my life recently because it says these words, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. And what God has been saying to me, and I think this helps us as we go from here to there, is this word shelter literally indicates something of privacy. It indicates something of being alone inside. In fact, the Hebrew word for shelter literally means it will absorb people who are desperate to get into it. It's not just for people who are just striding in and who are just ready for an encounter with God. It's for people whose culture has become pursuit. I will do anything and everything to find God in my situation, in my workplace, in my marriage, in my family. That is my life ambition, that God will be glorified in my situation. No matter what your here is, I will find the shelter of the Most High because there's power in the secret place. Why is there power in the secret place? Well, it goes on to say this, that when you dwell in the secret, secret place of the Most High, you will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Shadow indicates something of a public statement. The sun coming down on God and you are resting in his shadow. God is not resting in your shadow. You are resting in his shadow for he is the main part of the story when we read the gospel. This book has never been about finding us in the pages of this paper. This book has never been about where do I rest, where do I lie. This book is all about exalting God and showing that He is the main part of the story and we get to participate with Him in the grandeur of His mission in this world. And that is something to celebrate about. You know, your private informs your public. What you do by yourself will eventually manifest itself in the public eye. That with God there is no secrets, do we understand that? For our historical context is that for too long we've been trying to hide from God. Genesis 3, we made a mistake, he comes walking in the garden, Adam and Eve immediately hide and we have been hiding ever since. But God in your brokenness wants you to come to the secret place with him. Why? Come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you what? Rest. Rest. Not rest you will find on a holiday. Holidays are good. Don't get me wrong, I can't wait for my honeymoon. Praise the Lord, hallelujah. (laughs) But you find a different kind of rest in the secret place. You find a different kind of rest when you are alone with God. A rest that can only come from that source of God that will replenish your soul. It will commission you into your workplace to be a pastor of your groundings. How much would your workplaces change if you decided today from now on, I am going to be the pastor of this workplace? What would change in your sight, in your life? Instead of going, there's loads of things going on, I need to find a pastor to help me. What would change if you became the pastor of your office, of your workplace, of your situation? If you adopted the mindset of, I am here to serve these people and be a servant of grace, not just a receiver of grace. Things start to change because there is power in the secret place. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, the church will always remain within the confines of the upper room. 
The upper room is where the disciples waited for the Holy Spirit. And if we don't receive the Holy Spirit, we will remain fearful inside of the church instead of taking place and power in the public place. The church was designed to move outside of the walls. God is far more interested in our sending capacity than he is in our seating capacity. Can we hear that as we look for a new church? God is more interested in how much we send people into the world than he is in how many bums we can get on the seats. For the missions in the streets is far more important than the bums on the seats. And I made that rhyme to make myself look cool, which didn't really work. It's power in the secret place. Jesus then goes from the power of the secret place and he goes on to do one of his biggest most greatest miracles that we've ever seen. Skeptics know this miracle. Atheists know this miracle. Agnostics know this miracle. And it is hugely criticized because who walks on water? Has anyone in here seen anyone walk on water? Of course we've not. Because it is only the Son of God that can do such a thing. And here he is walking on water and everyone knows this story and lots of things take place within this story but it comes from the power of the secret place and then he starts to walk on the water and what starts to take happen? We see storms are happening. Here I find myself as a 16 year old boy in the middle of the storm. Questions, frustration and anger. And I wish I knew back then that there was power in the secret place because it would help me a lot. And here I am in the storm in the battles, not knowing what's going on, lots of confusion, lots of questions, lots of aggravation in itself. And Jesus comes walking in the middle of the storm. You know Jesus walks on the water that you find yourself drowning in? You don't need me to tell you the Greek word for lifeboat, but you need need me to tell you that Jesus walks on the waters that you find yourself drowning in. That he's involved in the situation. The disciples what do they do? They turn to the side and they shout out something. It's a ghost, screaming, fearful, not knowing what's going on. It's a ghost, it's a ghost. The waves are kind of going around. Why on earth do these guys not recognize Jesus even though they've been following him for the last year and a half? Why do they suddenly go to the conclusion it's a ghost and they get scared and they get fear? Well, I believe sometimes the storms of life can easily take our gaze off the king of kings. And when that happens, we get confused. And not only that, in the storms of our life, Jesus loves to be within the storm and not just void of it. Jesus isn't void of your suffering. And Jesus isn't void of the suffering of this world. Jesus is partaking in it. Because he loves us. And he desires for us to understand that he loves us This world doesn't need to hear what they're doing wrong and what they're doing right. This world needs to hear that Jesus can relate to all the pains that we can experience in this world. Jesus turns up. The disciples are confused. They don't know who it is. One of the things that I've learned as I've transitioned from my here's to there, and I'm still doing it right now, and many of you will be in the same process, is that God is the God of unexpected arrivals. He's the God of interruptions. He's the God that turns up in the mundane, normal situations. He's the God that doesn't just turn up in the miraculous, big lights, great speaker, great band. He's the God that turns up on the Monday morning whilst you're having your coffee, getting ready for your day. This is the God of interruptions, the God of the coffees, the God of the lunch with your colleagues, the God of your workplace, the God of small conversations. And he gives you the responsibility to enter through the doors that he opens for you. How are we looking out in our day for moments where God is breathing life and he expects us to blow on it a little bit more? For that's the point of the gospel, right? That we participate in what he is doing. We are no longer spectators of the gospel. We are participators of the gospel. And let me tell you something. If you are currently a spectator of the gospel and you come to this church and spectate the gospel, you will soon get bored of this church and you will soon get bored of those preaching and singing. Because I don't have enough in me and I can dance, sing and do as I like to entertain you, unfortunately. (laughs) The world has got far more greater sources of entertainment than I currently have and Mark has and Nita has and the team has and even Nige has. (laughs) And he's a funny guy. We are called to move from being spectators to participators. The gospel is there to be used 
and worked and chewed through and motivates you to do your day. The gospel can change lives in your communities, in your family, in your marriages, in your children. How, when was the last time that God showed up when you was reading your bedtime story to your daughter or your son? That's the God of interruptions. Yeah. You don't need a stage to see these things happen. We need confidence that God will move in the small and the mundane, not just in the big and the bright and wonderful. I'd love Chris to come forward if that's okay. Hasn't Chris done amazing this morning, by the way? Back on stage, where he belongs. I love that we have so many brilliant teams here, teams that are already starting to prepare for when we finish in a few moments' time. We have teams who serve, and one of the things that I've noticed in this church is people don't get saved because of the preacher at the front. People get saved because of the love in the seats. And there's so much love going around in our teams. And with this whole participator, spectator stuff, let me encourage you, look at where you are serving Find somewhere to excel and allow the fruit of God that God is creating in you to be shared with those around you. You know, most of the fruit of God in your life will not grow on your tree, it'll grow on other people's trees. It'll grow on those around you who you're helping, discipling, loving, mentoring, showing kindness to and grace to. The fruit of your life will often grow on other people's trees for other people to taste it, for other people to see. And how can we allow that to happen with the unexpected God. Finally, I want to close. We're just thinking of Peter in the middle of this storm. And something that I believe we can learn from Peter's life as we come towards the end of this major story that is etched within the fabric of human understanding, that everyone knows that this story, most people have heard it, most people know about it. There's some skeptical about it. There's some love it. There's some that allows it and encourages us. Everyone knows it. And what can we learn from this story? Sure, we can learn the major principles that I'm sure many of you have heard before. That God is with you in the storms. Don't allow the storms to dictate your worship, but allow your worship to dictate your storms. May your worship stand strong when you're in the middle of storms. And God is with you. He is not void of suffering. He is in the suffering. And sure, we can learn these things, but I believe there's something else that we can learn as well. Because this story ends in a peculiar place. It ends in the place, as I said at the beginning, of Peter's first moment where he met Jesus. Jesus is taking Peter on his homecoming. And he comes back to the lands. And I'm sure when Peter gets on the boat with his disciples and he's going to meet Jesus on the other side, there's all kinds of things going through his head. He's excited to see friends and family that he left a few months ago. He's excited to show people that he's made the right decision in following Jesus. He's excited to step off the boat and say, hey, you all need to do what I did a, a year ago because it was the best thing that ever happened. And he's excited to go home. And as he's on the boat, I'm sure visions of his child that are coming back. Pack. He's reliving memories that, he ex that existed in his life many years ago. Midway through, the storm takes place. Jesus walks on the water. Peter is a little bit sceptical, is a little bit, uh, he doubts the situation. So he says, hey, prove it. Prove that you're son of God. Let me walk on the water. He walks on the water. He starts to see the wind and waves around him instead of fixing his eyes on Jesus and he starts to sink down. Jesus grabs down, he pulls him up and he literally throws him back on the boat and then Jesus gets on the boat as well. Imagine how Peter felt in this moment. Here he is, Peter in his here moment, excited about going home and seeing his friends, excited about seeing all his family that he's left, excited about sharing the good news of Jesus. And suddenly he's gone from here to there, where he's sat in the boat, he's a few moments away from arriving to his hometown and he's dripping wet, embarrassed and frustrated because of the situation. In fact, tears are probably in his eyes because this is a man of pride. It's a man of leadership. It's a man of the front man. And here he is dripping wet and the disciples are like, hey, Jesus, you just give him a moment. He's a little bit wet. Hey, someone bring some towels forward. Let's just dry him off before we get off the boat because everyone's going to be waiting for him. Let's just see if we can help him. Let's see if we can get him a little bit dry. Has anyone got a hairdryer? Because they had them in them days. And here they are. And Peter's sat there. He's drying his hair. No, he's not really. <laughs> Washing off with his towels. Frustrated disappointed, feeling ashamed. Peter could have waited to dry off, right? He could have said to his disciples, hey, you guys just get off the boat. I'm going to stay in here until I feel a little bit more presentable. 
until I look a, a little bit more clean. But he doesn't. Steps off the boat. And the Bible says that immediately crowds started to gather and Jesus started to heal people. And, Jesus, and Peter's there, dripping, soaking wet, ministering with God, seeing people healed. Church, we need to stop looking for the clean Christians and start looking for the surrendered Christians. For too long, we've looked for people to dry off and get clean. And we need to move into a new place where we go, the gospel is enough. For I believe Jesus took Peter all the way back and allowed him to experience the storm of his life for one reason and one reason only. Because Peter needs to realise in order to go from here to there, from here to there, in the moments of a life, we must remember one thing. The gospel is enough. Church, we must come back to the basics. We must come back to the basics. The basics of the gospel that transform our life every single day. The basics of the gospel that doesn't wait for people, doesn't wait for people to dry off before they can be used. But they understand that the gospel empowers people's lives even in their brokenness. For it, let's face it, we're all wet anyway. And in church, we don't want wet servants. We don't want wet hospitality teams or wet welcome teams. We don't want a wet band and we certainly don't want a wet preacher. So waiting for people to dry off and God's done with the waiting. He's moving. For the Lion of Judah is on the move.